University of Illinois in Chicago. And uh, the title of the talk is Boundaries, Rigidity of Representations and Level of Exponents. Thank you very much. Um, it is a great pleasure to be here, a great honor. Um, everything I'm going to say here is based on joint work with uh, Uri Bader. Yes, you use the mic. Everything I'm going to say is uh, based on joint work with Uri Bader from the Technion, as well. And uh, more details you can find in the uh, paper that we wrote together for the proceedings. So, uh, in this talk, I want to touch upon three themes. Um, level of exponents, which is a topic in uh, ergodic theory. It refers to products of matrices along orbits of uh, some dynamical system. I will uh, talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, super rigidity, which is this whole area of research that uh, emerged uh, after the breakthrough results of Margulis in the 70s, this refers to rigidity of representations of certain discrete groups, lattices and high rank uh, these groups. <coughs> and there is this uh, boundary theory, which is a somewhat big uh, term. <coughs> this is, uh, it refers to several constructions that uh, associate spaces to groups. Um, spaces on which these groups act, and, uh, and those uh, are supposed to help you understand properties of the, the groups, their representations, actions, and manifolds, and stuff like that. So, um, in trying to understand superjective phenomena with uh, Uri Bader, we were uh, eventually led to uh, some variant on the definition of the boundaries that we found very useful, and uh, uh, I uh, yeah, I should have said that the three topics are, of course, related uh, and were related before. For example, uh, in his uh, original proof, Margulis used Lyapunov exponents, non-vanishing of Lyapunov exponents for a certain cycle uh, in the proof of superjudicative theorem. Um, but what I will try to describe, uh, or at least indicate some uh, connections, is uh, some definition of boundaries that helps us uh, uh, to prove some uh, more results and make some others more transparent. Okay, so let's talk about these level of exponents first because this is uh, uh, some uh, most technical part. So um, XMT will uh, uh, denote here always the probability measure preserving uh, system. So XM is a standard probability space. T is the transformation of that space. Uh, it it is assumed to preserve the measure, and I'll take it to be invertible, uh, and we'll assume ergodicity, which means uh, some irreducibility condition uh, that can always be achieved. Uh, well, classical ergodic theorem of uh, Birkhoff says that if you take any L1 function and start uh, adding its values along orbits, uh, for almost every point, you will uh, experience linear growth, and the constant that, you know, the slope of that uh, linear growth is exactly the average value of f. So this generalizes a uh, strong law of large numbers. Uh, it's, it's very useful here. However, uh, in practice, you often need uh, not only add functions long, long orbits, but sometimes you need to uh, multiply matrices the long orbits. So suppose that you have a matrix valid function. Uh, and, uh, well, you, as I said, you, uh, I'll assume it is in SODR. The whole point is non-commutativity of matrix multiplication. Um, mathematics is about that. So uh, uh, the determinant can be always cleared out. So we, we look at fx times f at the next point, at the next point, and so on. And you extend this uh, definition, this sequence of products, also in the negative range by this formula. Um, you want the, the most important thing is that this uh, sequence of uh, functions forms a cosine. So, well, this is like uh, if f uh, is a derivative uh, matrix representing a derivative of some diffeomorphism at the point x, then uh, you know the boxed thing here is uh, changing. Okay. So what we would like to understand is uh, uh, 
uh, it would be very useful to know the asymptotic behavior of that of such products, which much like uh, in Birkhoff's theorem. Um, and matrices are supposed to act on vectors, so you also want to know what happens with individual vectors under symbols f and x for a typical x. The answer is given by so-called multiplicative ergodic theorem. It was proved in 68 by Oscillates. And it can be stated like this. So we assume again XMT is as before. You have a matrix valid function and you uh, assume this integrability condition here in blue. Yeah, this works. Uh, then associated with this data, you have uh, certain constants. They are uh, the chi's, they're called characteristic exponents, or let me call them characteristic exponents, and they might come with certain multiplicities. These are these integers, the one to ds. Together, they add up to zero. Um, now, this is constant all over the system, but for almost every x, um, associated to that, you have a splitting of Rd into uh, vector subspaces, uh, the ith subspaces, dimension di, uh, and what is special about these subspaces is that a vector belongs to the subspace, if and only if, um, when you uh, apply f and x to this vector, then you experience exponential growth. Uh, that's why these are characteristic exponents. Well, growth or contraction, depending on the sign, but uh, moving in the forward uh, in time and going to infinity, you will see, uh, oh, okay, it was supposed to be plus minus here. Well, moving forward in time, you will see e to the n times chi i as an uh, approximate value, and uh, in negative time, it will be e to the minus n times chi i. Okay, I is a factor of n minus. So, um, now, uh, what about general vectors, not only in the union of those subspaces? So if you have a vector who has non-zero non projection to the L1 space, then uh, under forward iterates, its growth e to the n chi 1, the growth of that component is going to dominate everybody else, and therefore this vector is going to grow like uh, with characteristic exponent chi 1. But it fails to be in, uh, fails to have a uh, projection to L1, so it is in the span of L2 and others, then, uh, you know, it will be carried away by the next one. So this way you get, uh, the full description is like this, so given this splitting, you have a pair of flags that I tried to describe by these boxes here. So the blue boxes, so these are nested family of uh, spaces, they tell you what happens in the future. So in the, if you are in the most outer box, so most vectors grow with exponent chi 1, the next one with chi 2, and so on. <coughs> when you are in the, uh, going in the negative direction, the roles are reversed, and you get that flag. So these flags are, in general, of different types. Okay, and since the whole picture is, uh, you know, everything is, uh, if and only if here, you get automatically equivariance of all these vector spaces. So the spaces at Tx are the f image, fx image of the spaces uh, at x. Okay, well, one can rearrange this information in what is usually called Lyapunov exponent. So you write the chi's with their multiplicities and let's call them lambdas. And then we can uh, write this as a diagonal matrix lambda 1 to lambda d, so essentially like those, and then it lies in the uh, positive wild chamber of the Cartan subalgebra of SOD. Um, and one can uh, rephrase the multiplicative ergodic theorem as saying that uh, F and X behave in the group SO and R uh, like this expression where, so these are rotating factors, they can be taken from the uh, SOD compact subgroup, but what's important is the dependence on n. So the dependence on n comes from e to the n times lambda, the exponential one. So this is the asymptotics. So if lambda is non-zero, if, if uh, you know, no, not everything vanishes, then you actually have some 
some growth, exponential growth, and you are following a uh, geodesic of certain type, and the type of the geodesic is determined by lambda. So there are two basic questions that uh, arise here in this setting. So in Birkhoff's theorem, the, the speed, the, the lambda, uh, was explicitly given by the integral. But in these situations, there are uh, very rarely any explicit formulas. If they exist, this is some miracle. Uh, but other, at least some uh, qualitative, in this, uh, you know, can we give some qualitative uh, uh, information about things? So, for example, it would be really good to know whether, given uh, you know your system and your matrix field function, whether uh, lambda is non-zero, because if it is zero, we have almost no information. If it is non-zero, then we get a bunch of a bunch of stuff on this metric space. We have some linear drift. And we have those equivariant families of flags, which are very convenient. So this is exactly what Margulis used, uh, for example, in the other um, But it would be really best if your lambda was a regular element, uh, you know, interior element in this uh, positive vial chamber. Then all the lambdas are different. And then, uh, these uh, flags, well, then, then the splitting is into one-dimensional uh, lines, uh, subspaces, and the flags are full flags. So they have very rich structure at hand. So this is something that people care about. Well, but this is hard to achieve. So uh, yet, you know, uh, let's progress in that. So one situation is uh, understood really well, and this is uh, the situation of random walks. So imagine that you have uh, just a bunch of matrices, and uh, uh, you have some uh, coins of different weights, and you flip those coins to uh, produce uh, new matrices independently of the previous ones, and you multiply throughout. So it fits in uh, our framework uh, that we described if the underlying system is just the Bernoulli shift and the function there cares only about the symbol at time one, then the cycle that you see in the positive times at least will look like that. In the negative times it will be a product in the other direction of the inverses. Okay, so for those systems in the already in the 60s, or the 60s, Persenberg proved a beautiful theorem that if you look at the support of such mu and look at the group generated by that, you close it. If it is non-amenable, so essentially if it is not solvable by compact, then the spectrum is non-zero. There is some drift. Okay, and this is a beautiful theorem. Notice that things don't depend so much on the on mu itself, just mu doesn't have to be trapped into in a compact by solvable sub. A much more refined study was uh, uh, done by Givarsh and Raji and then uh, by Goldschild and Margulis in the 80s. And the net result of this is that if the uh, supporting mu generates a Zaritsky dense subgroup, then the spectrum is always simple. Well, then there is enough of, of, of the chaos to, uh, to produce that. And, and this is very useful. Now, much more recently, Avila and Viana were able to formulate conditions uh, that give a simplicity of the spectrum in much greater generality. Um, they, uh, I will not be able to uh, formulate it here, but uh, uh, there, is, uh, there are assumptions on the underlying dynamics and some assumptions on the co-cycle that uh, have to be verified. Um, and uh, these conditions, for example, allow them to prove uh, simplicity of the spectrum for conservative storage cycles. Uh, this uh, has important implications to dynamics on rational billiards and uh, will well, might be mentioned in other talks. Okay, what I want to describe briefly is the result with URI that we obtained about simplicity of the spectrum in some situations. Uh, where our point was uh, we would like to go soft, first of all, not much assumptions on underlying X M, T, uh, and also to involve groups. So the setting is this. Um, so you have X M T from before, but now imagine that you have some uh, group gamma around, 
Uh, and for that group, you have uh, some uh, function from x to gamma, and you can form a cocycle. So you can multiply long orbits again and call this little fn x. And now, uh, what this gives you is some walk. Is some, so for almost every x, you look at f of x, f of t of x, and so on, and you multiply them. Uh, that gives you some walk in the group. So I try not to use the word random walk, uh, word random walk because the steps are not necessarily independent. They, de uh, you know, uh, they come from uh, iterations of t on x. And now, um, with that, we, uh, since every x gives me a path or, uh, in gamma, um, I have a distribution on those paths. And m tilde here is going to denote this distribution, except that if I look only at those, all these paths, by definition, at time 0 pass through the origin. But let me shift things around by simultaneously translating everything by gamma. So I have a bunch of, uh, kind of paths starting from different places, but there is a distribution of them. Um, uh, and uh, with this, one can define two spaces. Um, one is sort of the space of ends at plus infinity, another is at minus infinity. It's kind of a boundary behavior. So the formal definition is that you look at, you know, you, you have your paths, now you think of rays, so you just forget times, negative times. And then you uh, look at the ergodic component for the uh, shift action, but this is a one-sided shift. That gives you one space, and then doing this with negative times, you get the negative shift. So this construction is exactly the construction of uh, Fersenberg Poisson boundary for random walks, if you're familiar with that. But let's not uh, dwell on, on this. It is, uh, I know it's a little hard to absorb when you're looking at this uh, stated this way, but I want to make an assumption that, and this is a key assumption, um, that these spaces uh, are kind of uh, weakly independent from each other, by which we will mean that if you look at the measure class of M tilde and project to these two quotients, you will get something equivalent to the product of these measure classes. So it is kind of, uh, you know, an optimist's uh, point of view on life. It's sort of independent of, doesn't matter where you come from, you know, you can reach any uh, destination in life, you know, if you wait long enough. So it's something like that. So things are in two. Okay, let's take this uh, as an assumption that this is possible. But then the theorem says that if you have a, a KMT, and let's assume it's a K system, and you have a, a, a function into some group, and you happen to have this independence of past and future in that group, then for any Zaritsky dense representation of gamma, this composition will give you a system with simple spectrum. Uh, so this, for example, uh, allows you to reprove Givars Raji and Goldschild Margulis in a slightly different uh, way because you just, uh, uh, you know, if you drive your thing with independent increments, so if you're doing really <coughs> random walk, uh, then this assumption is satisfied automatically. Uh, and we see all the ingredients, the risky density gives you simple <coughs> spectrum. Now, there is a cosecle version of that that means that not only you can take a representation of the group, you can also uh, take uh, a gamma action on any probability space, probability image preserving action. If you have a Zeritsky dense cosecle, those things appear in uh, rigidity theory quite a lot, then uh, you know, the skew product that you get here also has a simple spectrum. So this gives a lot of flexibility in using those results. So for example, I just mentioned Gibarsh, it allows you to reprove Gibarsh, Raji, Goldschild, Margulis, but it also gives you a new result even in the random walk setting, because if you take any Zariski dance cycle of any group, now this shows that um, fitting it with a random walk on that group, you will always have simple spectrum. Uh, you can also have a geometric uh, example where you take a compact negatively curved manifold. Uh, think of some surface, hyperbolic surface or something like that. 
and you uh, look at the risk events representation into some uh, simple Lie group, and then you can use geodesics on M to produce matrices because you, you just uh, pick a geodesic, you flow for a long time, you get a long piece of geodesic, you close it this, uh, by some prearranged uh, short clo uh, loops. Uh, that gives elements in the fundamental group and you can send these to matrices. So this procedure is well known. Uh, you can think of it as uh, some geodesic flow on, uh, on this bundle uh, rule. But the statement is going to be that statistically it will give you simple spectrum whenever you use a Gibbs measure on for, for your geodesic flow polymer so that will be would be examples. Uh, those things can also be used to uh, prove simplicity of the spectrum for conservative storage per cycle, but not for all cases, but for the top strata. Okay, so uh, if that was a little technical, let me switch to the another topic. Uh, uh, almost entirely, and this is rigidity. And I want to state the theorem that uh, is uh, kind of, uh, I think it has uh, the higher high rank rigidity phenomena in it, uh, um, kind of the most transparent way, and also I hope to be able to explain the proof. So uh, the situation is like this, you take, uh, a bunch of groups which we assume to be locally compact. Um, in fact, I will need to assume that they don't have uh, discrete quotients. I forgot to write it up, but need to write it up. But this is uh, uh, okay. A generic think of I don't know automorphisms of trees or, or Lie groups or something. Okay. So these are quite general locally compact second countable groups. Now gamma is going to be a lattice in G, so it's going to be a discrete subgroup of finite co-volume, uh, where the volume, by volume I mean uh, harm measure on uh, these groups. And let's assume that this lattice is irreducible in the sense that it has dense projections to the factors. So these are standard uh, assumptions reminiscent of uh, Margulis's super rigidity in the case where the ambient high rank so in a simple Lie group has, uh, it actually splits this product of simple ones. Here, n is going to be at least two. Uh, I mean, it's kind of hidden in this assumption. Okay, so you have this situation. So the ambient group G has a lot of commuting elements. Any element from G1 commutes with every element in G2, but gamma typically doesn't have any of those. Okay, it, it kind of, it is related to G because it is a lattice there but the relation is a little abstract. Okay, and now we want to look at some representations of them. Uh, representations in general may be uh, a little uh, complicated to give a proof of, although similar theorem holds there, but I want to, uh, uh, yes, I want to do this. I want to act on a circle by homeomorphisms. Um, <coughs> now, so the target group here is homeomorphisms of the circle, which is not even locally compatible with the large Polish group, uh, but it sort of behaves like, I don't know, rank one uh, creature. In particular, it doesn't like commutation. There are not many homeomorphisms of the circle that commute with each other, uh, un uh, unless you are acting by rotations or something. So let's assume that we have an action of gamma on the circle by homeomorphisms, we'll assume minimality. This is a, a cheap assumption. Uh, and let's assume that we are not conjugate to rotations. Okay. Then the theorem says uh, it's a super rigidity phenomenon. Uh, namely, I mean, uh, what usually is meant by this is that the representation of the discrete group uh, turns out to extend to the ambient group. And uh, well, usually you can analyze that much better. So in this case, will be able to say it extends to an action of the product, which happens through one of the factors, which will act through PSL2R, or rather, well, finite cover of PS, uh, finite central extension of PSL2R, but that's minor. Uh, 
so you get all of this, so the trick is kind of to recover the, somehow to see the commutation that happened in the parent group and see how um, uh, gamma could use it. Okay. Uh, so the, such a result was proven by Gilles uh, long before, but uh, uh, well, he, he did uh, another case, the higher rank semi-simple Lie group here, including the simple factors, and we tried to push another agenda and, and uh, generalize the G's. Uh, G's. Uh, well, there is also an addendum. If F is finally generated and, has, uh, and the action is, let's say, faithful, then one can actually classify the, this story completely. And this has to be an S arithmetic lattice, so something like, like this, uh, with one of the factors being S of 2 R. OK. So uh, what I want to explain is uh, what's behind both of those stories, because the, the point is that they're related. So uh, there is some uh, uh, boundary theory story here that I want to say. And um, uh, there is a definition of a boundary that we're using. But uh, unless I have, uh, I'll, I'll see about the time. So I'll explain the key ingredient here. That, uh, uh, this only if, if I have uh, time at the end. Uh, but this is a rather abstract definition which says that uh, we need some auxiliary spaces and we, will, we are going to be looking at pairs of spaces simultaneously. So we are going to talk about boundary pairs. So two spaces now, they are going to be measure spaces with measure class preserving action of gamma. Uh, and there are going to be two assumptions. One is that uh, the action of gamma on each one of them uh, is amenable in the sense of zero. This is a uh, uh, standard assumption in this area and is uh, not difficult to come by. But the second assumption is the crucial one, that the quotient from uh, the product to each one of the factors is relatively isometrically required. So it is a very, well, it's a new notion, and it is a strong ergodicity property. Uh, often the b's are going to be the same creature, and uh, then this is going to be b times b over b is relatively symmetric thereby. If b is like that, then we call it a boundary. So what's important about this is, this is that boundaries exist, um, and they have nice properties. So take this as a black box. Uh, but the thing is that if a locally compact group G acts, you know, has B as a boundary, then also all its descendants, all its lattices, uh, inherit those properties. So it's automatic in this. Also, it is convenient uh, and it behaves well for products. So if you have a boundary for G1 and a boundary for G2, then you can take the product and this would be a good boundary for the G1 times G2. The usual examples are boundaries, just nobody cared to uh, check that. But uh, if you look at uh, flag variety with the G, G mod P with the uh, G invariant measure class, then this is a boundary for G, where G is semi-simple here. And it is also the boundary for all of its lattices. Uh, and moreover, any local compact group has boundaries because the Poisson boundaries, well, Introduced by Furstenberg in the 60s, they they have all of that uh, thing. Uh, well, if the random walk that creates them is asymmetric, the, the pair has to be one for the future random walk, another for the backwards random walk. Okay. And uh, in theorem here, oh, I see that the colors a little bit uh, mixed up. So suppose that you have gamma, which is uh, uh, some, some group, arbitrary group, uh, and you look at the Zaritsky dance representation of it into G, where G is a simple D group. Um, and suppose that you chose a boundary pair for gamma. Then there are gamma equivalent measurable maps, as in this diagram. And let me uh, spend a couple of minutes describing the diagram. So there is a map from B plus to the probability measures on G mod P. Existence of that map 
uh, is a consequence of amenability. So it's a gamma equivalent map from here to here. And this has been used by uh, Zimmer and uh, all the followers uh, always. Uh, it can also give you uh, existence, usually it gives you also existence of uh, uh, an uh, equivalent map into G mod Q, where Q is some uh, parabolic, non-trivial parabolic, not all of G. Uh, so it gives you existence of some map into some flags. But the point of that upper half is that Using these uh, definitions of uh, uh, boundary, or at properties of boundaries, we're able to show that <coughs> those maps always land in G mod P itself. So they go here not to some measures, but to Dirac measures. So we have this P plus arrow, and this is, uh, uh, will be useful. Also, well, the same thing holds for B minus. Again, usually these are the same thing, so it may be the same statement, looks like, except that there is the middle part. When you think of them as a pair, the two flags that you get for almost all choices of point here and point there are in general position. So they create for you uh, splitting into lines. So in the case of SLDR, what we have is automatic measurable gamma equivalent map from these boundaries to these flags. From pairs of points, it goes to uh, splittings into lines, um, and, and these diagrams are consistent. Okay, the second part of this is that, well, let's take B minus B plus equal B, and then this whole uh, diagram, it has a fair amount of uniqueness in it. So the upper map is unique, so is the lower map. So phi minus phi plus, they are unique. The middle one is not entirely unique uh, because uh, for, for good reasons, uh, the file group of G acts uh, on, uh, on this creature by uh, symmetry. So there is an action from the right of the file group. So it's going to be the permutation group on these symbols here that will act in a way which is uh, which commutes with the G action, and therefore uh, no uniqueness can be achieved, uh, you know, it's only up to these orbits. So the second statement here is, uh, tries not to ignore it, but to harvest that information. What it says is, okay, maybe there is, um, so let, let's look at the source, B cross B. B cross B might have also some intrinsic symmetries as a measure space. So maybe there are some measure class preserving automorphisms of this guy that commute with gamma. We're going to exploit them actually. We call them the generalized wild group for uh, some good reason. But uh, this, uh, this group uh, can be used, the elements of this group can be used to precompose the dashed uh, uh, map. So the uniqueness that exists in the dashed uh, area, in the middle area, is that any precomposition with something here has to be compensated by some symmetry on the right, so namely by an element of the classical Bible group. And this gives you a homomorphism from this group that we are controlling uh, into that group that is of interest. Well, you might ask, well, what symmetries does B cross B have? Well, the obvious one, the only obvious one, is just flipping the two coordinates. Um, that will always, because of the construction, go so it's like flipping up and down here. Uh, this uh, will always land in the long element of the bio group. Okay. So, so how does it help you to prove uh, uh, simplicity of the spectrum for, for the Lyapunov exponent? So there were assumptions in that theorem, and in them you had space of ends kind of in the future and space of ends in the past, they were called E minus and E plus. So the main point in the, in the proof is uh, first statement that these E minus and E plus, they actually uh, form a gamma boundary pair. So these spaces, I didn't mention that before, but 
they were quotients of space of paths in uh, gamma, and they come automatically with some measure class preserving action of gamma. So that gamma space is measurable gamma spaces. Um, the theorem here is that they, they have enough, the, because of their kind of orthogonality, uh, the uh, gamma action on them uh, has this strong ergodicity properties. By applying the theorem on the previous slide, this uh, big diagram, I cut it into half, or rather two thirds. So I kept the middle and the upper half. So we have this piece. There is a map from E minus into flags. And we have a map from E minus E plus into ordered splittings of Rd into linear spaces. And now we can feed all of that with points from X. So X was this uh, our probability space on which dynamics was happening. Each point there defined paths, and those paths had ends forward and backwards. Therefore, we have to almost every point in X, we associate a flag. This is and also a splitting. So this looks like the conclusion of a Slavitz theorem, the conclusion that we want to reach, but we have it for free because of soft reasons. And now, using that in kind of reverse engineering move, you can exploit the fact that these maps exist to begin with, and using some Martingale convergence theorem, you will have something that uh, the Barshan regime called contracting property. Uh, but in addition to that, because of simultaneous existence of this splitting in an equivariant way, uh, you, the whole picture becomes very, very easy because you can, using that, you can sort of diagonalize the, the system. Okay. So, uh, well, that, that slide was uh, supposed to explain that the way from here to the proof is uh, rather short. It uh, takes a few pages on it. <coughs> um, okay, so uh, now uh, a few words how uh, this philosophy helps you prove uh, the super rigidity result about the circle that I mentioned from before. <coughs> so, uh, well, there is, uh, there is a step here that was done by Gis and then uh, Margulis in another short paper uh, uh, also added to that, but there is some reduction to a situation which is called minimal strong proximal. And, and in that situation, you can use uh, the ergodicity properties of any boundary, so you choose any boundary for gamma, B, let's call it B, uh, it will follow automatically that there exists a gamma, a unique gamma equivariant map from B to the circle itself. So a priori, again, usually you have, a, a, because of amenability, you have a map into probability measures on the circle. Uh, but in this case, you get into individual points. This is a useful map. Um, and then uh, in a kind of uh, discussion which is sort of like that in spirit, but much, much easier in, in practice. Uh, in, in the discussion of the circle, this would be a circle, this would be a circle, and these would be pairs of distinct points in the circle. Um, you get a certain map from B cross B to pairs on the circle, and that will, the circle is round, comes with natural cyclic order, it will automatically show you that the associated and a vital map, the, the map from the group that I don't know yet, uh, will land in the cyclic uh, target. So we get this, this homomorphism. Now we're going to remember that gamma was a lattice and product of uh, 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 local compact groups. So we choose a boundary for each one of the groups. Um, and therefore, B1 times B2 is a boundary for G1 times G2. But because of uh, those general properties, it is also a gamma boundary. And now we want to look at the bio group for that B. So we are looking at the symmetries of B cross B. But now B cross B has B1 times B2 times B1 times B2. 
So in addition to the natural flip, which takes two pairs, P1, P2, and flips it like this, we have uh, you know, a few more elements. We can flip the B1 components independently of B2 components. So this file group now has Z mod 2 times Z mod 2 in it. It's called Klein group, something. Okay, and this is already cool. So this higher rank phenomena, this commutation in the G's gets manifested in this, uh, in this tiny uh, finite group, but it is still something to work with. In fact, uh, that's the whole point, because if I have a homomorphism from this group into a cyclic target, it has to have a kernel. And in fact, you can, uh, looking at this uh, uh, more carefully, you see that the kernel would be one of those factors itself. So it's identity here, and then the, so this has to split like that. And once you know that it has to split like that, that this homomorphism of wild groups was not an abstract thing, it was related to the boundary maps, it would follow automatically that the boundary map that went from B to S1, well, B was actually B1, B2, it actually has to factor through, through B1. And now, B1 was a space on which G1 was acting, and gamma 1 has a dense projection to G1. All of that put together can be uh, used in a rather elementary way to show that this map has to extend to a continuous map from G1 to homeos of S1. And then uh, that part of the story can be finished by known technologies that uh, uh, Etienne explained to me many years ago. Uh, the final bit about uh, arithmeticity, it's actually a completely different story, uh, but it can be derived from uh, some work that uh, Uri uh, and I are doing with uh, Roman Salarit, but all the lattices in general. Okay, so maybe a word about this uh, isometric ergodicity. Um, so the... Um, a couple of minutes for that. So uh, remember that uh, oops, um, that if you have a measure class preserving action, it's called ergodic if uh, there are no non-trivial measurable invariant subsets, which is to say the same, there are no gamma, me measurable gamma invariant maps, gamma invariant maps from B to two points, right? Or rather, uh, if, if you have it, then uh, any such map is a constant, okay. Now, a word that, uh, I don't know if it's a good term, but that's what people are saying now. Uh, let's say that an action is called isometrically ergodic if, okay, now there is a little twist here. The target space is not going to be two points, but it's going to be a general metric space. You can assume it to be separable, but otherwise it's not, other than that, it's not important. Suppose that you have a general metric space and let gamma act in it. So assume that you have a pair a metric space and the homomorphism from gamma to isometry is of that. You can think of a Hilbert space and the unitary representation if you wish, but it can be arbitrary stuff. And, and underlying action gamma on B is called isometrically ergodic if whenever you have such a target, gamma equivariant maps are necessarily constant. So there are no twists, it's kind of twisted or ergodistic with coefficients, what uh, Mark Burger and Nicolas Manor used to, to call. Or, well, their coefficients are uh, one of spaces. Okay, so this is the <coughs> absolute notion. And what is relatively asymmetrically ergodic? Uh, so it, it's going to be not about uh, one action, but pair of actions which are related by in Quotient. So a map between gamma spaces D to B, D for double, D to B is relatively isometrically ergodic if whenever you have a measurable family of metric spaces indexed by B on the bottom, um, so this is going to be a measurable family of, so the fibers here are going to be kind of metric spaces, maybe different ones. They're going to be above some uh, base space. And suppose that gamma acts on this family uh, in a way which is isometric in fibers. 
uh, relative asymmetric periodicity is the requirement that for any such situation there is uh, this uh, diagonal lift. So there is a, an invariant section. So uh, that's the definition. Uh, of course, one needs to discuss why is it uh, useful and how it uh, comes about in the, uh, in the proof of uh, uh, the claim. Uh, but uh, I won't do it right now. OK, thank you. Thank you speak again. Thank you.